everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, I'm Tamar hustovsky bendes I'm co-chair with Professor Yan Ingles of the Israeli uh, chapter of Icon S, and uh, we are very happy to have you here for a joint event um, of the Rubinstein Center for Constitutional Challenges at Reichman University, together with the Israeli chapter, chapter of Icon S. Um, so as you know, we're um, hosting here two colleagues, two distinguished colleagues, uh, to talk to us about um, the Constitutional Assembly and constitutional making attempts uh, in Chile. Uh, I have to say that when this topic or the idea of, of hosting this um, hosting this event in the Israeli chapter of, of Icon S or in, in Reichman University uh, came, first came up, Israel was very much occupied with what was termed here a constitutional moment and the um, possibility and the need for constituting a full written constitution for Israel and the public discourse was very much occupied with the question of how to reach there, whether a constitutional assembly was realistic, whether it is something that we could even imagine, as most of you know, I assume, I know, I assume Israel does not have a full written constitution. And it was very much relevant and interesting, not only as part of their general interest in comparative constitutional law, but also specifically in the Israeli context. Uh, since then, things have happened, um, and we've, we're, we're in the middle of war, and reality, political reality changed around us. Um, but I do suspect that talks about that the cri this the crisis will actually bring again um, the discussions of the need of a constitutional and of something new to come out of, um, um, of this crisis. And we're very much looking forward um, to our talk here today. Um, without further ado, I want to um, present our guests, our, the speakers today. We will start by five-minute presentation of the of the processes of the assemblies, and then we will go back and forth again. For each of you, we'll have five minutes to present the facts, and then we'll, and then we'll go back to have ten minutes to kind of analyze and discuss and comment and to hear your insight. Um, so our first speaker is Professor Isabel Aninat. She serves as the dean. If I'm pronouncing anything wrong, correct me. This is the comparative constitutional you know, realm. We're used to doing that, and we can correct each other. Um, so our first guest is Isabel Aninat. She serves as the dean of law of the as the dean of the law school at Chile's Universidad Adolfo Ibanez UIA AI. Did I pronounce it right? Okay, thank you. Previously. Um, she was a researcher at CEP at Chile, and Inet has co-authored several books and is the author of various articles in the area of law and public policy. Um, she was part of the Technical Commission for the Constitutional Process in 2019 in Chile. She serves on the Board of Advisor of International IDEA, the Board of the Tinker Foundation in the USA, and on the board of several Chilean think tanks and NGO. Um, our second guest is Professor Sergio Verdugo. Sergio is Professor of Constitutional Law and Human Rights at the IE University in Madrid in Spain. He's also the Secretary General and Co-President-Elect of the International Society of Public Law and then an editor of the International Journal of Constitutional Law. Um, Sergio was a director for the Center for Constitutional Justice at the Universidad de... Now you have to help me here. Desarrollo in Chile. His work has appeared in journals such as the Columbia Journal of Transnational Law, the University of Michigan Law Review, Global Constitutionalism, ICON, the Hag Journal on the Rule of Law, and many others. And we are very honored and happy to have you here. And I want to um, open your mics, and we're looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you very much uh, for the invitation. Um, so the agreement was that I was going to start with the convention that ended in 2022, and Isabel is gonna speak about the council that ended in 2023. So I, I will I will start. Thank you very much uh, for the for the invitation. I will share my screen. Give me a second. Okay, so actually in Chile, we have had many um, replacement attempts to the uh, constitution that is uh, currently in place, which can be traced back to the Pinochet regime in 1980. Uh, the, one of the main problems 
that the Constitution has uh, is the fact that it was enacted by an authoritarian dictatorship under undemocratic uh, conditions. And there have been some attempts at replacing it. Uh, all of them have failed uh, for different reasons. Uh, we can come back to them uh, if you want later in the questions. I'm going to focus in attempt what I call number four, the 2021-2022 constitution making process that ended um, in 2022. The Chilean constitutional convention that attract uh, a lot of uh, commentators and it, it, it provided for a lot of um, um, for, a, for a political momentum that was very, very important in the country. Even though this attempt has failed, uh, some have claimed that the that during this constitution making process, the original constitution changed enough uh, or there was a rejection of the uh, constitutional structure. Uh, so far as a, as a constitution making process uh, happened in a material way, even though it didn't uh, formally change it, uh, the constitution. So um, I think the most immediate uh, um, um, and this then can be traced back to the social outbreak that happened in Chile in, 20, in 2019. Uh, during that time, under the right-wing uh, government of uh, former president uh, Piñera, there was a protest uh, in the Santiago, the capital city. Uh, a group uh, stu of students' federations were, uh, blame, were complaining against the rise of the metro ticket in Santiago, and soon thereafter, many, many uh, groups joined. Uh, so it was not a demand about uh, about the metro ticket. It was a demand about uh, different groups uh, putting together their own demands. All of them have in common uh, an aspiration of material equality. You could see demands from uh, indigenous movements, uh, also environmental movements, feminist movements, uh, social rights generally. Uh, perhaps the most important ones were related to healthcare and social security, among others. This uh, this joined with protests that preceded them in the in the previous in the previous years. Uh, also, in the previous administration, so the administration of Bachelet, uh, she had tried to change the constitution uh, before uh, using the language of social rights. So the reason that she invoked to change the constitution was to improve the social rights of uh, Chileans. And I think even though her process failed, the narrative of changing the constitution according uh, for the purposes of improving social rights sticked at the level of public opinion. That's my interpretation uh, of this. So um, many people, the polls showed at that time that when people wanted to were uh, asked why they wanted to change the constitution, which was a very popular demand, uh, they typically associated it mostly with problems on in of inequality um, uh, and social security uh, and, and others. After the social outbreak, um, uh, the President Piñera called for emer an emergency regime. The military went out of the streets. Human rights violations were uh, committed al alongside episodes of violence. More than seven, more than seventy metro stations, for example, would, were burned. Supermarkets were sacked. Uh, hotels and, and so on. So uh, the parties were kind of desperate. And even though the right wing parties in the past had refused to change the constitution and to agree on a, an agenda of constitutional change, uh, now they were cornered. Uh, and the survival of the of the of the Piñera administration was at stake. So they decided to come to an agreement to open uh, a constitution making uh, process. Uh, the agreement was not to replace the constitution, but just to open a process that could uh, fail uh, or not. They wanted uh, to uh, set the interests of the parties and they designed uh, a system that was going to reflect the interests of the parties. For example, they wanted to have the uh, electoral rules for the lower chamber of, uh, of the, the lower chamber of Congress. Uh, they reproduce those rules for the new constitutional uh, convention with the expectations that the parties were going to drive uh, the process. Right. So this is how the chamber of deputies looked at that time. Uh, you could see the, the blues are the right wing and the rest are the other forces. You could see that they are more or less uh, split. They wanted to avoid this. This is the Venezuelan Constituent Assembly that didn't have uh, a good uh, reputation, of course. Um, that's why I have I have argued that the original uh, intent of this process was to avoid two extremes: one the, the Pinochet framework and the other one the neo-Bolivarian framework that doesn't lack that doesn't have a good reputation uh, in Chile. 
Um, so they, they design a lot of rules to search for approving the norms, um, among many, many others. But the agreement that the parties achieved changed it, and it changed it because of a lot of social pressure. Uh, so they started to include uh, some rules. One, uh, gender parity one of, one of, was of one of them. The two most important ones for uh, that conditioned the election were the reserved seats for indigenous peoples, adding 17 uh, indigenous peoples, and special rules for independence. These rules were very, very important because they lowered the entry cost of independent candidates in a context in which the anti-party narrative was becoming very prevailing, right? So uh, this opened the doors for the people to vote uh, for newcomers. They didn't know enough uh, as a, a way to reject the party system. Not only the right-wing government, but also the, uh, the, the traditional mainstream center, uh, center left. Uh, in the entry plebiscite that opened this process, 77.85% uh, of the people uh, voted that they wanted a new constitution. There was a second question about the mechanism. Uh, if you, uh, you want to change the constitution, how do you want to change it? There were two options. The, fir the first option was a fully elected constituent assembly, and the second option was a mixed convention composed partly by elected citizens and partly by uh, seated, uh, sitting legislators. The people voted more, uh, there were more votes for the elected assembly than for the approval in itself. That, that can say a lot about how the people were basically using this uh, as a way to reject uh, the party uh, the party system. And the polls at that time showed that the reasons of the approval were connected also with uh, social uh, rights. This, of course, doesn't say anything about whether uh, con constitutions are a good mechanism to enforce or to protect social rights. It's just about the matter of uh, perception. And then the elections of the uh, Constituent Assembly came. Here, I, I put uh, two images comparing on the left uh, the, con the Constituent Assembly, Constitutional Convention, and on the right, the lower chamber of deputies, which was elected a little bit after the uh, Constitutional Convention in the same year, in 2021. Uh, they had the same rules with the differences I uh, mentioned uh, before, but you could see enormous differences. If you look at the, at the right, uh, you will see that the um, electoral forces are more or less split in the right uh, and, the, and the left, more or less half, half. But if you take a look at the constitutional convention, you will see that the political parties lost control of the process uh, mostly. You could see, for example, the blue, which is the right wing, Vamos por Chile only obtained 37 seats out of 155. Uh, also, the mainstream center-left parties uh, were very, very, uh, performed very, very poorly. The convention was dominated by newcomers, by independents. Some of those independents were uh, associated with the party, with the list of the political parties that allowed them to run through the list, and others were running uh, through their own list and their own alliances of social uh, movements. Movements. Uh, most of them were inclined uh, to the left, but they did not pursue a partisan uh, agenda. So the idea was to substitute the ideological uh, representation that parties have provided in Chile for a more descriptive and symbolic uh, representation that social movements and single party candidates uh, were providing to the uh, to the system. Um, and and that's why a, a lot of independents with radical agendas were elected. Voters knew little about them. These were not guys that they knew much about. Uh, an example is the so-called Lista del Pueblo. They elected 27 uh, seats. They campaigned on the basis of killing President Piñera. Their advertising was actually a literal death uh, of the president. So it was a way to appeal to voters that were mad at the political class, right? But voters knew very, very, very little about the actual platform of this independence. And many of them did not have a, a holistic systematic platform. Most of them were just single uh, issue candidates or were compromising with other groups. So some of them were uh, campaigning, for example, on the basis of improving the healthcare system. Other ones were, were campaigning on the basis of improving the right to water, which in Chile is a very uh, politically sensitive issue uh, and so on. Uh, but only a few of them had real proposals about the uh, party structure, about the political system, uh, and a more holistic approach to the constitution uh, overall. Uh, so in the, in the end, uh, the constitution was the time for uh, for the independents that were inclined to the uh, to the uh, left. It was socially inclusive. 
uh, but it was politically unbalanced. It was far away from the preferences of the median voter. If one looks at the uh, at the polls at that time, uh, it is very easy to see. Um, sorry, uh, it is very easy to see that. Uh, at the polls somewhere uh, I can hear. It's very easy to see that the, prefer the, pref the preferences of the citizens in specific issues, such as emergency regimes, abortion and others, were very far away from what the convention was actually uh, ap approving. And there were also some procedural rules that were very important for the convention's functioning. So they decided uh, to, um, uh, to give um, so the, the main proposals came from the committees. The committees were composed by those um, uh, sitting convention members that had more intense preferences on specific issues. So, for example, if you were an activist in favor of decentralization, it was very likely that you will end up uh, in the committee that was going to write the rules for the uh, regions. Um, so uh, they started to play hardball with the plenary of the convention by proposing uh, norms that were uh, very radical. And the plenary ended up to become the place where those uh, proposals were supposed to be uh, moderated, uh, which is something weird uh, in constitution making. And there was also uh, one, um, uh, there was a circular procedure that uh, ended uh, with, the, uh, with the plenary that didn't have the possibility of revising the norms after these norms were approved. So it was a, a chapter by chapter or article by article uh, approval uh, that didn't generate uh, enough incentives for the different sections uh, of the convention to achieve compromises across different topics. So in the end, it was uh, the convention work uh, in a, uh, accumulating the different preferences of the different uh, in the independence. The proposal was, uh, of course, didn't say much about the governance model uh, for Chile, didn't say much about the political uh, system Besides, uh, besides um, uh, for example, removing the Senate and replacing it for a regional chamber, but it didn't say much about how to tackle the uh, historical problems that the Chilean political system has, such as a uh, gridlock and minority presidentialism. It didn't say much also about uh, political parties or how to solve the problem of having an extreme fragmentation in the Congress with more than 20 parties that uh, high elevate the transaction costs in the legislative process uh, a lot. Uh, so uh, during the campaign, uh, um, many people, including people from the uh, approval vote, um, recognized that there were things in the proposal that couldn't be changed, but uh, they should be changed. So they made a call uh, led by the president, who turned to be the de facto leader of the approval campaign, uh, to uh, approve the proposal and amend it after the proposal was uh, approved because they didn't, they couldn't procedurally change the proposal uh, before. Uh, and of course, this uh, I think this my interpretation of this weakened the chances of the uh, of the uh, proposal. Also, the fact that the president's rating started to decline could have been influential in the proposal's uh, uh, defeat. In the end, the September uh, plebiscite of 2022 uh, ended up with a 61%. Percent a point eighty eighty six percent rejection with a very very high turnout is one of the highest turnouts in Chile's history uh, partly due to the fact that voting in this election was mandatory unlike the other elections uh, that uh, preceded it. Thank you. Uh, thank you um, very much. Thank you. Um, so I will continue. I have a very short PowerPoint presentation as well. Give me one second. Wait. Sorry. There we go. Um, okay. Um, so thank you for the invitation. Um, I'm Isabel Laninat, and I, I'm going to start where Sergio finished. So what happened after the referendum? Um, rapidly, there's a, a conversation started among uh, political parties um, and the government sort of um, tried to lean in but then um, sort of reach, uh, played out actually of the game and uh, this was the moment that an agreement was reached by then the president of the lower chamber and the upper chamber. So as you see again we had an agreement of 
almost all the political parties um, in the in the process that Sergio referred, the Communist Party didn't sign in in the process that uh, I'm referring to, the second one, um, the Partido Republicanos didn't sign in. And this will be important because of something that I'm going to explain in a minute. Uh, but as you see, um, this was an institutional agreement to restart again the process, and it was reached um, a couple of months after the 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 result of the first referendum in September. Um, the second process you can only understand that the design as um, a reaction to the to the the first one, right? To the first constitutional assembly, uh, it was um, different in terms of uh, it had. Uh, two-step process, but there are many bodies that intervene. So what happened is that it, it was divided in two phases. First, there was a phase uh, of uh, 24 um, experts nominated by Congress, so both the lower and the upper chamber, which was what had gender parity, but also it had um, political parity in the sense that it was 12 and 12. Um, and so all the, the the political parties came together and had to present a full body of 24 experts. Um, experts included uh, 14 um, um, lawyers, but also there were many uh, former ministers or former um, Congress people. They had a lot of political maneuver. And so that was uh, important for the negotiation that came um, that started in March, in early March. In Chile, we have vacations in February, so we're almost there in vacations. So, so this started with the regular year in early March when the expert commission started to do their work. And the, in parallel, we had an admissibil admissibility body um, with also uh, experts who would um, decide if any of the proposed norms were against or or could be interpreted against what had what we call the doce bases which were 12 um sort of set rules of the game that in the initial agreement in this agreement were established so these were very general rules that stated things like chile must be uh, democratic Chile must have some type of indigenous recognition. Chile must have, um, Chile is a unitary country, so we're not moving into a federal system. But they are very broad in terms of there was no specific design. For example, there was a discussion if the rule allowed for it to be a parliamentary or a presidential body. That was how general the rule was, but there was a committee established to sort of, um, supervise the, um, the compliance with these 12 points. Um, what happened, the, the expert commission was constituted, you can see there um, the body that uh, worked for almost three months, uh, four months actually, and um, they produced uh, almost unanimous uh, first draft, okay? This was an interesting uh, process because uh, in the, after two thirds of their of their time, we had the second the election for the second body, which was the fully elected convention. I'm going to go to that in a second, but they had to work almost for um, the last third of their time uh, for a proposal to be reached that would be handed to the elected convention. But they knew who got elected at the end, right? So there were some political incentives going on. And they were able to reach almost uh, an almost, and uh, I would say it was ninety percent of everything was I reached as a unanimous proposal, as a unanimous draft. They submitted, and I put uh, to the right the photo of uh, the who was then president, Veronica Ondoraga, and vice president Sebastián Soto. Uh, she's from the left. She's she's from the right, and they worked very in tandem. Uh, to produce this draft, and they sort of submitted this um, as a complete uh, proposal. Um, what happened? Uh, the second part of the process included an elected body. Um, and this was, I would say, well, as you can see, it's much more smaller than the one that uh, Sergio showed. Uh, this was not 155, 54 people. This was now 51 uh, people. And, and, and as you can see, the composition is now much less fragmented. 
So before you saw a lot of colors, now you see uh, only sort of three colors. And this goes this way. Um, the Partido Republicano, which is the, the light blue color, um, was the party that I mentioned did not sign the entry agreement. And they are a new, um, a sort of new party. Um, they started, um, I would say, less than eight years ago. But they had um, a very strong presidential candidate. He went into the runoff against President Boric. He got elected on the first uh, round of, um, of the election with as the first majority, and they are from the far right. Um, then you have the orange ones to the right. They are the traditional right. And in the middle, you have uh, all the parties from the left. So the composition was almost the opposite as what Sergio showed. Of course, this is a smaller assembly, but as you can see, it had um, a right-leaning convention. And what was again important is that a quorum, the quorum discussion, which was important in the first one, was also important in this, in this one, because you had to reach, um, you had to have at least more than one third to block a proposal. And as you can see, the right, including the mother right and the, and the farther right, had more than two thirds. And so they had the maneuver for the negotiations. Um, what happened? Um, so they got elected in June, they started in July, and then they um, got in session until October. What happened was that they produced a final draft that went into the referendum. Um, this is an analysis that was done of how they voted. Um, and and the, the red lines are how, how different were their positions. And as you can see, they, ha they didn't have much difference in the political system and in the reforms to the justice system. I would say that the justice system had one of the strongest and more important pieces of reform in what, in what was submitted as the draft. But there were a lot of differences in terms of uh, principles, civil rights, and especially um, social rights. So again, as Sergio mentioned, social rights was the key discussion, and I would show some of the of the of the things that moved voters, but less so the political system. Um, what happened during 2023? People were fed up with constitutional debate. Um, this is a question that was done. The, the darker blue line, September, October 2023. So this is two months before the referendum. How interested are you in the process? We had a referendum with mandatory voting. 47% say, I'm not interested at all. I don't care. I am i don't care. Um, and, and you see that only 24% of the people said, I am very interested. So that what happened was during the year 2023, after the, the first one failed, people didn't want to know about uh, the convention. We had mandatory voting and a lot of people voted. Um, this is like record numbers from Chile, 85, 84% of the population voted on both elections, but the people were not following the debate at all. Um, and this is what sort of how the process played. You can see the red line. Please only follow the red line. This is March. Uh, so when the when the process just had started, um, what you see is that um, people started this uh, with the idea that I am against this process. Um, and this was even before there was one first draft at all. So the first draft came about in June, and you can see that there. Some interest was gained, but then rapidly people started saying, I'm not, I'm against this, whatever the result is. Um, and this is important. Uh, this showed, this is from the social outburst to the end. And it shows the idea of, well, what are we doing this for, right? And please follow only, um, let's go to the first question. This is in Spanish, uh, or sorry, in English, it says, it will probably help to solve the problems that we have. So in, tw in 2019, you see that a majority of people trusted that this was the institutional channel to solve the problem. By the end of 2023, you see that less of 20% see this as, a, as an avenue to sort of channel reforms. And even more so, people at the end said, it will probably leave things the same. That's the middle answer. And what's that? 32% says, this will, this will probably turn out for the worst. Um, and so you can see how, after four years of constitutional discussion, there was a long sort of um, process of 
we have other problems in Chile now. The main discussion is, well, it's always the economy, but besides that, it's crime and security. And that was totally shifted the conversation and the agenda. Uh, so this was the exit referendum. Uh, what happened, this was the, um, the Sunday before Christmas, um, and, and, and this was mandatory voting again, a, a big turnout. Um, and you see that 50, almost 56% of the people voted against uh, the proposal. Um, and just for one second, um, I wanted to show you um, two things. Who voted more against? So if you compare um, ages, you see that young people um, tended to vote against the proposal, but also again, women started to vote more than, more than men against the proposal. And this is interesting because one of the um, debates that we have had here in Chile is why, um, what motivates people to vote in favor or against of the text. And for example, abortion was a big debate during this convention, the regulation of abortion, a general clause. And you see that women moved against the text. So maybe, yes, people vote for uh, some of the issues that were um, put again put up, put there in the text as a proposal but then in the polls what you or, or in the general service what you see is that people tend to say that they vote against or in favor if they see a general agreement of where this is going and again what you saw during this process even though there was less fragmentation was that there was no real um sort of a social or um, a political affection in the debate and you saw one side against the other and so um, tossing and turning on the specific issues but there was no general agreement as what had happened with the experts at the beginning. Um, so this is where, where we are now. Uh, the process ended as I mentioned in December um, there was some debate at the end if um, there should be another process starting, uh, but now you see the polls and nobody is real uh, is really interested in the constitutional debate or in a or in a big constitutional reform um, for now or for the coming years, at least in the near future. Thank you. Thank you both for fascinating uh, presentations. We're going to you're going to each have ten minutes for analysis now. And then uh, Professor Yaniv Rutney and Professor Yav Orgad, who are um, co-directors of the Rubinstein Center, will take lead the discussion. So feel free to write questions if you have them during the presentation, and uh, we can start there. So I, um, I think that one of the main lessons of the Convention's failure has to do, uh, and of the Council's failure, has to do with the uh, impact that the party system can have in constitution making uh, processes. So the convention was not approached as an opportunity to fix the party system because it was composed by members that were not repeat players. They were not supposed to be uh, members of the of any parties uh, anyway. So they didn't. There was no incumbency problem, right? And this speaks directly to one of the uh, so-called advantages that, that some scholars have raised on why extraordinary assemblies are better fit to produce a constitution compared to sitting legislators. The experience of the Chilean convention and of the, uh, and, and somehow also the experience of the council uh, shows that this incumbency, uh, pro, uh, the incumbency problem is not only a reason to support an extraordinary body, but it's also something that should make us approach these bodies with more, uh, in a more cautious uh, way. Uh, for me, one of the most uh, serious things of the uh, convention was the fact that the proposal uh, was uh, in its content uh, very lacking of solutions for the uh, real problems that the Chilean political process has, with, which has to do actually with the party system itself and with the, the way the political regime doesn't provide incentives for collaborations. In Chile, there are no uh, electoral pacts for government beyond the elections. Uh, so this creates a lot of uh, uh, small parties that are undisciplined uh, and therefore uh, electoral platforms do not last uh, very long uh, in Chile. This, in my view, is what has been producing the issue of not responding to social rights demands because the process is gridlocked. 
because it's blocked, because there's no incentives for agreements and cross-party collaboration, it is not possible to build sustain politically sustainable solutions for the future in, in the legislative process. And the fact that the convention didn't produce a proposal to tackle these issues, I think uh, says a lot. The council is a more mixed experience because it, it tried to tackle this problem with the, uh, with the proposal that the experts provided. Uh, however, that proposal was later modified, as Isabel explained, by the uh, council itself, the elected members that were dominated by the right wing, and produced a proposal that was uh, perceived largely to be a right wing proposal. So the first proposal of the convention was left wing or perceived as left wing, and the second one was perceived as right wing. None of them appealed to the medium uh, to the medium voter and and this should say something about how we uh, make the parties um, relevant for any constitution making uh, process um, if we take a look at the types of failures that we see in constitution making uh, I think there are at least three types of constitutional failures that we need to address. One is the authoritarian failure has been uh, addressed a lot in the literature, the experiences of Venezuela and Hungary and other countries. And then we have other two types of failures that have been less addressed in the literature. One is the activation failure, which Sama Sakharov and I have theorized a little bit in a recent paper we published, and the implementation failure in which a constitution is approved, but then later is not really, uh, it doesn't really uh, stick. This is a case of an activation failure. And activation failures haven't been addressed enough in the literature. In Chile, we have uh, we have some cases, we have the replacement attempts that preceded uh, Lagos, then we have Lagos attempt in 2005 that succeeded to approve a reform, but didn't succeed to, uh, to show this reform as a new constitutional order, so it failed at a substantive and symbolic level. Then we had Bachelet's attempt, the convention's attempt, and the council's attempt of 2023. All of them had to do with political parties, parties either acting as veto actors or parties opposing them. When the party system is against the proposal or when a relevant par uh, part of the party system is campaigning against the proposal, uh, it's unlikely for the proposal to gather enough uh, buy-in from social sectors. And this, I think, is a very important uh, argument also from a normative perspective, uh, because from a normative perspective, parties are better suited than social movements to provide ideological representation and political balance to these types of bodies than social uh, movements. If we take, if we go, go go out of Chile and we take a look at activation failures in other contexts, and I'm, I'm not speaking about contexts where we are building a state from scratch and where there is a, re, a regime change, and speaking of contexts where uh, there are negative cases associated with representative institutions that are in place. And the big question that we should ask ourselves is what is the role that we're going to give to the political parties in this context, right? We have the demand usually uh, of uh, establishing new measures for legitimacy or new sources for legitimacy because the parties are flawed somehow. But despite those demands or despite those problems, the parties are going to be relevant. And therefore, if we need to be pragmatic and um, focus on how to approve a new constitution, we need to deal with them. And because cross-party collaboration is more likely to produce liberal outcomes and restrict political power and prevent a dominant party regime, there are also normative reasons associated to the quality of democracy to do this. If we take a look of negative uh, cases uh, or activation failures, we take a look at Kenya to uh, 2005, France in May of 1946, before the Fourth Republic, uh, Iceland in uh, 2012, Pakistan 1945, Nepal 2012, Chile with Bachelet. Uh, in all of them, we see how the uh, parties were behaved in a way or were, were not strong enough to be able to pass the um, to support and make sure that the constitution was going to pass uh, in, in in some in some of them uh, the parties were split uh, and when the parties achieve uh, when there were agreements 
uh, for the parties, uh, usually uh, these negative cases do not take place. We, we see uh, positive cases where the proposals are actually uh, approved. So if you take a look uh, at the cases that have been studied mostly uh, in the literature, which are su successful cases like Italy, India, Spain, Colombia, you all see uh, political parties or the equivalent of political parties if political parties do not uh, yet exist, achieving a cross-party collaboration to provide some sort of um, some sort of um, substantive uh, representation to the uh, to the prof uh, process. So this should uh, make us think of why not give the responsibility to independence or single issue groups. And I understand that this is not a politically correct thing right now with the problems of representative democracy and the way many scholars have uh, addressed the issue of uh, representative institutions uh, not uh, being as popular as before, right? There is a huge pressure for new direct democracy uh, mechanisms for more transparency and also for giving these uh, other groups uh, a better role, right? If we take a look uh, at the scholars like Ackerman and Elster, we see arguments saying, for example, that these groups are less committed to institutional continuity and therefore the incumbency, they, they lack the incumbency problem and they're more likely to offer a constitutional change and they can somehow provide a, a legitimacy to the system that the political parties cannot provide. However, having said this, these things uh, also come with problems. Single issue groups and independence, they raise the transaction costs of the politics. The preferences are very narrow and they tend to be intense. And therefore, if they work at just accumulating the preferences, they are going to uh, release proposals that are far away from the uh, median voter and may not even tackle the problems that the median voter needs for them to tackle. Uh, they can turn the constitution making process itself into accumulation of preferences. And those movements can be uh, strong in terms of descriptive representation, which is a good thing, of course, but is of course uh, not uh, enough. Uh, I think in context where representative institutions exist, political parties should be used. This is by no means a sufficient condition for, uh, uh, for the efficacy of the constitution making process, nor for the legitimacy, but I think it's a necessary condition in these types of processes and the discussion of how to integrate participatory mechanisms and other forms uh, to legitimize the process should not discourage the use uh, of uh, political parties. And this should let us think about how to design a process either in a constituent assembly or using say, sitting legislators also with the idea of uh, plebiscites. I'm not sure if I have enough time to refer to the idea of plebiscites and referendums, or I can leave it for later. Yeah, maybe in Q&A because I see there's already a lot okay. of questions. No, no problem. <laughs> um, I'm glad Sergio covered political parties because I fully agree with him, so I don't have to sort of address that. I'm just going to add a few, um, let me add, five or six um, issues. One, I think is, uh, well, you can say, but the second um, assembly or, or, the, or the second uh, convention was stronger on political parties. It was designed that way, right? It was designed to give a stronger role to political parties. Um, but but I think it um, there was, there's a question that, that we should include, um, which is, what is the basis for entering a constitutional process? Um, as we, Sergio and I described, we were very fast in uh, reaching an agreement on the procedural issues, on the, how we designed the process. And you saw two processes that were completely different. Um, bigger, smaller conventions, um, the participation of experts or not, um, gender parity rule or not, et cetera. Um, but in, but in, in, in none of these two uh, processes, and we can add, President Bachelet's uh, process as well, there was a general um, agreement from the political parties on, okay, um, we are going on that direction. Yes, on the last one, the last ones, we had the 12 rules, right? The 12 bases. But as I mentioned, even those 12 points were conceived as red lines. You cannot go that far. Uh, but it was not built as a consensus on Oh, okay. We agree that Chile must have, uh, I don't know, uh, an, an presidential system. 
So we enter the process with a common ground, with a shared idea of where we're going. So everything was up for grabs, uh, everything. The role of the state, the role of the, of the private sector, um, the role of um, how the judiciary was designed at the same time that we were redesigning Congress and the presidential system. So, so, so that sort of um, put everything up for grabs at the same time that we have a very sort of shifting agenda, volatile uh, political system, right? Um, priorities change in three years completely. But again, you had very fragmented negotiations. So in the last process where you see a bigger role of the political parties, it's not that the political parties sort of, it's not that as the, the general political parties were backing the, these negotiations and sort of doing their job, it's that they said, okay, they are there and we are here, and they must reach an agreement, but they are there. Um, because, as I mentioned, people were not fully enthusiastic with this process from the beginning, and this sort of threw politicians away. So so I think this was um, a general issue of uh, how, with what common ground you go into these processes. The second, and, and I'm going to take uh, the last question, and, say, and I mentioned it, is what do people really vote for on constitutional referendums? Do they vote for the issues themselves? Uh, and this is an anecdote. I have a very, very good friend who started, who was participated in the, in the first process, in the 2022. Um, and he was absolutely convinced that when people read the text, they would find a reason to vote in favor. You could find whatever you wanted there. And they and he told me, like, but you will see that people will find their issue. And that's where they're gonna vote in favor. And the same idea, exactly the same idea you could hear in the second process. It's like, no, 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 no. This is important. You see it in the polls, and we will put it in the constitution because this will sort of call the attention of the voter and they will vote in favor of this issue. But again, in the polls, in the service, you you saw that people said. I don't like this because I, what I see is people fighting over pe things that I don't understand. And uh, and this is very fragmented and it's very complex. And, and what I see there is sort of polarization. Uh, and so what 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 are these sort of um, constitutional referendums getting uh, from the people? I think that that's that's an important um, issue to, to talk about. Um, the third one. Um, how much can we ask of a constitution? Um, in both cases, uh, you saw that um, for for the first one, it's it's difficult to think of an issue that was not addressed. Um, but 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 how much can we put in the constitutional text? Uh, how much can we stretch constitutional law? Um, what is the sort of public forum for the debate? Um, uh, and and I think this is a this is a question for us in terms of um, climate change was put in, gender was put in, but also the fungi was part of the constitutional debate. Uh, 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 and then you saw, of course, the judiciary, the Congress. So so how much can we sort of do these um, institutional arrangements for for channeling social demands through the constitution? I think it's an open question now um, because it has a lot of implication for judges and for Congress afterwards. Um, and, I, and I think this is sort of what uh, in Chile now for constitutional administrative lawyers is left behind. Uh, where should we sort of channel social reforms? Um, and then the other thing that I wanted to touch upon is it's, it's more of a, a smaller issue, but it's interesting. It's public participation during constitutional processes. Um, it's difficult to concede today uh, a constitutional process that has no public participation and I'm excluding referendums, okay? Um, so um, public audiences, um, people putting their issues through um, some type of uh, councils, local councils, um, um, internet voting and, and, and internet mobilization of um, different NGOs or, or, or local movements for um, the Constitutional uh, Assembly to address uh, a certain issue. We designed three public participation processes 
one in President Bachelet's government, one in the first assembly, one in the third assembly, in the second assembly. In the three processes, you had exactly the same turnout, 250,000 people. I cannot say if it's the same people. I would love to see the data. We cannot do that analysis. I wanted to do it. It's impossible to do it. But um, but maybe um, it's the same people. I have, I, or maybe it's not. But you see that, um, and what you see is that with the um, new tools for engaging people online uh, or through some type of easy access, vote here, give your votes here, um, show support for this initiative, um, you see that a lot of initiatives went through that way. And what happened? Many of them were rejected afterwards because they were not constitutional issues. So we had the firefighters um, who wanted to be recognized in the constitution. Everybody loves the firefighters in Chile. Um, who would not support the firefighter initiative, but then they got rejected. And that sort of generated a little bit of distance. Why are not they not including the firefighters? Um, and that you saw again and again. You had the most voted initiatives were for abortion, against abortion. What do you do with that? Um, you had uh, one of the most voted initiatives was for the legalization of all drugs. Uh, and that was super popular as well. And so that I think it's a, um, it's a warning sign of how much, uh, how, how should we extend the new platforms that make this very easy to access, very sort of um, fun and engaging. And you see that maybe this is a way to, for people to engage in the process, uh, but then you see um, sort of a bit of frustration with the process, but also that it, doesn't make a, a real impact, I think, my position um, in the final result, or does it help to the debate? Uh, and I think that's that's a minor issue, but as I say, um, it's difficult to imagine a process today that can be designed without, without some sort of these types of local and um, more specific issue-oriented public participation. Um, and, uh, and let me say one final thing. Um, I think in Chile, the, the discussion today is, well, then we lost four years. We came out of uh, this process more polarized, um, fed up with uh, this constitutional thing, uh, and with a more fragmented political system. Uh, and I think it's a difficult um, statement to hear. Uh, I think that we got two or three things out of it. One is that, yes, we did an institutional process to address um, social demands. This is maybe not as evident today as it was before in, uh, at the global level. And we sort of stuck to very institutional processes uh, that ended in failure, but ended in failure and that failure was accepted as well. The second one is, and Sergio men mentioned it, the median voter. So you see that, um, yes, referendums tend to polarize the public opinion, but also they show that the medium voter want moderation and they want agreements. And we rejected a left-leaning project and a right-leaning project. And you saw that um, people are calling for less partisan agendas. And the last one, and Sergio touched upon this, uh, is the role of political parties was, I think, not, um, I'm not saying that political parties now are booming in Chile because they are not, uh, but I think the idea of having um, sort of independent, new, um, very disruptive types of representation has sort of loose momentum and we're back to the basics once again. Thank you very much, uh, Isabel and, and, and Sergio. This was This was terrific, super interesting. I mean, uh, for us Israelis who have been thinking about constitution making and considering assemblies in the last year, uh, your talks have been raising so many important questions. Um, I'm not sure we'll be able to talk about everything, and, and I also want to give an opportunity for some people uh, in the audience to ask their questions. But maybe let me just briefly open about two or three things that, that interests me at least. 
One is the idea of transparency. Uh, because, you know, famously, Jan Elster always talked about how we need considered assemblies uh, to be not transparent in, in certain discussions in order to really allow people to, to talk about what they really think and not to speak to some kind of audience or political base. So, so one question that that is um, uh, that, that interests me is the is the transparency. How do you see it in light of your own experience uh, in Chile? The second one is about the package, uh, because we've talked about that, that. There is a problem that you give everything, the entire constitution making uh, process, then you give it as one product for a vote, yes or no. And as you said, there are things that people like more and people like uh, people like less, uh, but you only have like one vote that you need to. Every, to, to take everything and 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 then it also opens it to manipulation because you can sugarcoat it with some nice stuff uh but then put negative stuff in other sections etc so i wonder about the possibility of voting difference to provide a referendum with multiple questions on on different sections and then try to see what is the majority will that comes comes out of this process uh, uh that's me for now uh, Liav, do you want to ask something? Yeah, can you hear me? Um, for me, I mean, the interesting question, I just want to echo um, what you have said. Uh, it's it's a very important discussion, especially for uh, people like Yaniv, Tamar, and I from Israel who have been considering uh, constitutional assemblies, uh, citizens' assemblies uh, throughout the last year. And I wonder if there is something to be learned from the experience in Chile, but also the experience that was in Iceland, also a failed one uh, of having citizens' assembly uh, that can be gathered as a kind of now, uh, if we put it as a comparative uh, comparative perspective on, on citizens' assembly, because it has been much more successful on the municipal and subnational level even transnational level in Europe on the European level rather than on the national level. Thank you. So Isabel, do you want to start? And then I, after the uh, this uh, round, we'll Sergio, open it. Sergio, yeah. can we, uh, should we divide the questions? I can take the transparency one. Maybe? Yeah, you can just pick and choose whatever you want. Okay, it's also Isabel. transparency. Um, this is a very interesting subject. Um, so in the first assembly, actually one of the most heated debates on the on the 2022 assembly, one of the most heated debates was full transparency. Well, there were a lot of heated debates, but but this was in the beginning. The, the assembly had to put together its own uh, rules of procedure. We had um, mandated, um, sorry, I'm using the we, but that, this is a, a we, uh, the, uh, uh, the general rules, but they had to come up with the rules of procedure. Um, there were a lot of rules on ethics, uh, which are super interesting to analyze. If anyone here is into freedom of speech, I would um, command you to re re read those rules of procedure, uh, but also on full transparency. So the idea was that, that, com that the convention would operate under um, a full transparency, um, or, or, or as transparent as you could get, right? Um, and, and this was, of course, very much debated, but what happened in the end? And let me give you one, um, one example. Um, the political system commission, so they divided themselves in sub-commissions. The political system one um, had to come with an agreement to subject to the vote of the plenary on a new, uh, a complete new political system. You could, you cannot find recordings of those sessions. They even sessioned out of the building. They went into Universidad de Chile uh, and had sessions there. Uh, and so what happened in the end is that um, most of the real important negotiations did not happen on record. Um, they There were a lot of discussions, a lot of, you could access them on YouTube. You even go went into the, the web page of one of the main newspapers in Chile, and they were um, you you can access the videos online. So you could be working on the office and sort of having the video as the backdrop on your computer. Um, but the real negotiations did not happen um, right in front of those public forums. Uh, and even uh, in such an important issue as the political system, the real negotiations took place elsewhere. Uh, so I think this is again the idea of. Uh, the illusion of transparency, right? Uh, where, what do you want to get out of that of it? 
and and what incentives it's called for procedure in terms of where what happens, what are the records and the and 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 the sort of um, registry that you take on of these negotiations because of course there's the record of the of of when the plenary voted or the commission voted but not of the different options that were submitted and how they sort of put put together the draft and i think that that's an important um lesson to be drawn because it was one of the most heated debates at the beginning So I, I think for a, just a very uh, briefly on the issue of transparency, I think that one of the main criterion for designing a constitution making process is how to make sure that a constitution makers from opposite sides have enough incentives to collaborate in cross party proposals. Uh, and when you have, uh, when everything is transparent, uh, two things happen. First, their incentive is to appeal to their external audiences, right? And not to speak to each other. Uh, and second, if they want to speak to each other uh, without appealing to their external audiences, they need to find spaces that are opaque, illegal, uh, or basically badly seen, right? So, so that, that that that's one of the that's one of the issues. Even though in the case of Chile, I personally advocated and other advocates for creating spaces for uh, confidential negotiations, uh, it was basically impossible. Uh, it's just it's so popular. Um, the the narrative of transparency is is is, is impossible to fight against against it. And if you are a politician, uh, even if you think that uh, confidentiality is a good thing, and you are with Elster, um, the same Elster paradox suggesting that the conditions, uh, the democratic conditions, are unlikely to take place there, you know, uh, are going against your uh, your call. So politicians are just not going to accept it in their uh, in their narrative. Regarding the Sorry, issue, Sergio, yeah. just to interrupt you very briefly, but if you if you read things in Chile and they mention something about the kitchen, so yeah. this might it's it's okay. what we call the sort of the places where the negotiations take place. This is a very old story, but it's like oh, they met in the kitchen. Uh, they met in, they met behind closed doors, right? Uh, literally, people meet to for dinner and they negotiate there. So the kitchen is that concept. So, and regarding the question of referendums, I think it's very important. There's a lot to be said uh, to referendums. Um, so, but I'm only going to tackle uh, Janit's question uh, for for now. Um, so, one of the things that uh, is appealing for many constitution making uh, constitution makers is to, you know, if we are divided about an issue, let's ask to the uh, to the people. And there are good experiences about that. You can see the the Brazil uh, case, for example, when they asked the people to elect a presidential or parliamentary regime. You can see the Italian example where they asked the people to uh, elect either a, a monarchy, to continue with the monarchy or to move to a Republican uh, issue. And I think it can work, but it's very important to be cautious about the way you design them. In Chile, there was an attempt to do uh, what they call intermediate plebiscites before the exit referendum. And the idea was to, uh, to ask the people to vote uh, on issues that were divisive. So uh, the, the rule stated that the proposals needed to be approved by two thirds of the convention. And there was a proposal to say, you know, if they were not approved by two thirds, but they were approved by a lower supermajority, three fifths, uh, let's ask the people and let's make them decide. Most political scientists in Chile and constitutional co scholars were against this idea. And the reason they, give, they gave is that this idea heightened or elevated the, the stakes and uh, the moral hazard or during the negotiations, right? So during the negotiations, what you want to do is to achieve cross-party collaboration. If a party or a, or a specific sector thinks that they can be better off in a plebiscite rather than speaking with your adversary, they are more likely to conduce the negotiations not to achieve a deal, but to produce a breaking point and put a plebiscite. And this is very dangerous. Uh, it's very dangerous because it can incentivize uh, opportunistic uh, behavior from people that are not willing to uh, collaborate. Um, so if you are going to have intermediate plebiscites, uh, I would recommend looking at experiences that have been uh, positive about them and be very careful about the details. And I also want to refer to the uh, work of Roberto Gargarella, which I uh, completely um, uh, disagree with in this idea. So Roberto Gargarella said that the confirming uh, exit referendums are a type of electoral extortion. The reason is that they force you to approve uh, what you disagree in order to approve what you agree with. 
Um, so you should reject uh, exit referendums. Uh, but I think this idea is grounded on a wrong normative view of referendums. Referendums should not be seen as, as substituting representatives. They should be seen as invoking the citizens to use their veto power in the end. And it needs to be in the end so that to force constitution makers to actually offer a package deal before. If they don't succeed to offer a package deal, they will not have enough uh, buy in to have the voters approving it, right? So, and messing around with it and separating the play sites has the problem or the risk that I mentioned it, uh, before. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Sergio and Isabel. Uh, I want to open the floor for questions of the audience. Uh, some have already asked their questions on the chat, and Sergio uh, <laughs> rigorously answered. I think almost all of them. Adi has one more question, so I'll give you the floor, Adi. And if there are any more, we have like ten or 15, ten minutes to go. So, so please feel free to raise your hand and uh, your virtual hand, and then I'll just give you the uh, authority to speak. Adi, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, I would like to address the issue of embracing the constitutional solution in Chile, because it seems like both Chilean uh, political system and public opinion embraced this idea as a good solution. But uh, what was the circumstances that led to this? Because we, uh, it seems like it's almost spontaneously um, suggested. Um, uh, should we... Okay, um, I think um, yes, or, or it's um, it's difficult to understand these processes without um, sort of going a little bit back. I meant Sergio sort of went a little bit into this, but we had um, so the the constitution was originated in, in the dictatorship, um, and we had a big um, reform to the constitution in two thousand and five. Uh, yes, we had had many reforms to the constitution all over the years. Okay, so so we we have um, put in institutions, taken out institutions, um, adapted them, but but we had a big reform in two thousand and five, which sort of um, addressed many of the issues that were left behind with the dictatorship. Um, not not all of them, but but the core of them, um, and so then um, a few years later, um, there was there started to be as part of the presidential campaigns, um, the idea of we should um, draft a new constitution. Um, so when, when, when and, and President Bachelet did a constitutional process uh, without an assembly, it was led from the government um, with a very um, notorious public participation process. Uh, with local councils and local debates, etc., and she produced or her government produced a first draft, which she ended presenting to Congress on the last day of her government. So, as you see, even in a sort of very um, secure environment, in terms of this was not an, an extra assembly; this was led by the government. Um, the agenda shifted. There were other political issues uh, that started the government sort of weakened. And and this was presented on the last day as I check I did it, um, but you didn't have the political party consensus on on sort of moving this ahead. So when um, President Piñera um, sort of put forward the constitutional options and Congress and the political parties um, took it, it came from this history, right? It came from um, the trials and the idea that it had been put forward very with different sort of types of agenda, but it had been put forward in the public debate. And especially because the, the 2019 social outburst had such a wide um, agenda. If you went through the manifestation or to the protest, you see that some people were putting a signs for the pension system and others were putting signs for the health system and others were putting signs for the indigenous people. Another wanted vegan food. Um, and so you saw a, a plethora of issues. And so um, the constitutional idea of um, came forth as a solution because it was not a, a, a social movement on, I don't know, uh, the pension plans. It was it was a widespread social movement as, as 
tends to be in the world right now. Like this is Manuel Castell's investigation or research, but but he shows this all around the world. So so the constitution was seen as well. This is the place where you can address a lot of social issues, and that's why you see um, again and again that one of the most conflicting discussions was social rights. Um, it was gender and abortion and pensions and health, uh, and 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 there was. I would say one of the main um, nods, and it's also because that's what gets and, and cuts the most attention from people, right? Um, understanding judicial reform, sorry to tell you, but it's not very exciting. <laughs> For us, it is, uh, but uh, you but socialism. What happened in Israel in the in the last year? Uh, well, well, you proved me wrong. Now I see that, uh, but but. Uh, but that's, I would say, it's it's the history of why this came up um, as a solution. I see that there are many um, questions. So that's... maybe we should let Martin uh, ask his question, then we go back to to Sergio and Isabel. I, I think also Nadiv wanted to ask it. So Martin and Nadiv, and then we'll give you the last words of answer, and then we can wrap it up. Martin, please. Thank you. Hi, Sergio. Hi, Isabel. No time, no see. Um, I, I, I wanted to go back to the procedural aspects just a second because um, I think you both are right in that um, like political parties being weakened throughout the process was a key issue uh, because it, it, uh, it especially the first process lacked kind of uh, conduction and that made uh, agreements much more difficult. But I, I was wondering um, what, what have you reflected on the quorum um, and how the quorum I think was agreed upon under the belief that it would kind of protect the minority, wh whichever it was, right? By giving them veto power. But as in both cases, the minority missed the mark to, to get the veto, like they didn't get it. Um, yeah. it I think it effectively right. made agreements more difficult. Like uh, mm -hmm. the minority was forced into kind of irrelevance and there was no chance by which the majority would kind of uh, like across the aisle agreements, right? Um, and so, like, I want I wanted to, to ask you about what, um, where do you put that? Like, what balance do you get to that? Thank you, Martin. Maybe we'll let also Nadiv, and then we'll give the, the floor to Sergio and Isabel. Nadiv, please. Thank you. I'll be sure. To, uh, hi, Sergio. Uh, it's nice to meet you, Isabel. It was a wonderful presentation. Um, I think that Sergio and Isabel, both of your presentation ended in somewhat gloomy atmosphere in the sense the Chileans are asking themselves, what did we do in the last four years? So I wanted to take it back to Israel and to uh, share with you the fact that we had this kind of a majestical socio-legal process of our social constitutional protests in which our public, our body politic, uh, transform itself and improve its ability to talk about the Constitution. I think that here in Israel, we are talking about the fact that even though we still did not maintain our, ourselves a new Constitution or a constitutional amendment, we had a huge change in terms of public constitutional literacy. And I wanted to ask you, maybe not to finish this webinar with the gloomy uh, aspect, what do you think are the long-term effects of these four years on the ability of the Chilean public to talk constitution on constitutional literacy. Do you think that even though now we are in a point in which we're, you are asking yourself, what did we do? Was it a waste? The whole process and the whole public contestation did took Chile one step ahead in terms of educating the, the people to talk about the constitution. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nadiv. Sergio, please. Go ahead. Yes, uh, thank you very, very much. Uh, uh, both Martina and Nadiv, uh, I, I know both of them personally. I haven't seen them in a while, so it's a pleasure to see you guys. Uh, Martin, so Martina asked the question about supermajorities, right? So when you have supermajority rules, uh, it obviously elevates the uh, it elevates the transaction cost. It's harder to achieve political compromises when you have uh, supermajority rules, and whether we should revise those rules uh, or not. If we if we take a look at the comparative experiences, um, uh, take for example Bolivia and Venezuela, which are not 
good examples of constitution making processes, they both had two third majority rule. If you take a look at Colombia, it had simple majority rule, but it had a double vote, right? Which was very important to achieve agreements and to achieve cross-party collaboration. If you look at South Africa, for example, they work uh, with a sufficient consensus uh, rule, right? Um, and also there was a court in the end certifying the process and upholding the uh, interim constitution, which was very important for the uh, for, 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 for keeping the compromises. Um, so what I want to say here is that supermajority rules can help uh, but they should not be considered in an isolated way. You need to consider the process as a whole, right? The important thing and the criteria is how to build cross-party collaboration, right? In Colombia, it was not necessary. There was enough trans uh, fragmentation within the assembly to secure that whatever they were going to approve after the double turn of the voting was going to have a certain level of support within the assembly. In Venezuela, the two-third rule didn't matter because Chavez controlled more than 90% of the assembly in 1999, right? So a two-third rule was practically uh, irrelevant, right? So it depends on the design and the supermajority rules, they do not work alone. Simple majority can work well, it depends on the other things on the design and also depends on how the electoral system is organized and the party system uh, is organized, with, which are things that we uh, should take a, a look uh, at. So uh, re responding to uh, Nadim, uh, he asked about the long-term effects uh, that uh, we are seeing in Chile. I think uh, I'm, I'm not sure if I can predict the long-term effects, uh, but, but I'm happy to tell you a few things that could be helpful. The first one is that there is now in Chile a huge debate about whether the current constitution, which is still in place, has been legitimized. You know, if you rejected two proposals, then the new constitution has been legitimized. I think from a normative perspective, this is wrong. I I disagree with it because negative majorities do not make for positive majorities and uh, referendums are very poor substitutes of representatives. But there is still a, a debate about it and the way public opinion is going to perceive it, I think is largely influenced by the fact that public opinion is very fatigated by the constitutional issue. Right. So the discourse of, you know, we should have politicians taking care of the real problems of the Chilean people uh, is kind of becoming more important uh, in the political narratives than to addressing whether Chile should be a parliamentary system or, or a presidential regime, which is highly associated with an elitist, uh, you know, uh, approach to solve the issues of the real people, you know, that care about education and social security uh, and, and so and so on. Uh, for the constitution itself, I think the constitution is now unstable uh, and it has unstable content. Uh, I have called it a moving target constitution uh, with more details about why this happened. In between, you know, with these two constitution making processes, reforms to the constitution also happened. So we had replacement processes, but also amendment processes that people, uh, you know, they, they didn't put much attention because you have a replacement pro process next to you. But these amendments that were not very paid much attention to are very important today. So they lowered the threshold for constitutional amendments. That's a very important one. Another one that preceded that was the fact that uh, now there are term limits for legislators, which is making the political elites to renew uh, a lot. There's also the, a reform that lowered the threshold for approving uh, new and modifying organic laws which in the Chilean um, political system have been very important to, uh, re uh, to make the system more rigid in very sensitive areas. So the constitution is now more flexible in a way, but the, par the party system has uh, reproduced the fragmentation. So gridlock still exists uh, at, some, uh, at some point. And how this political system is gonna, uh, is gonna evolve with these new rules uh, is something that is very, uh, I, at least for me, hard to predict. Uh, yet. But what I can assure you is that the political system changed. Uh, it's not the same political system we saw before. And for me, these changes started when Bachelet succeeded to replace the electoral system from a majoritarian um, system that, uh, that uh, stimulated the bipartisan agreements and the two-party system to a multi-party system that is now um, fragmented and undisciplined. Um, Thank you so much. Uh, Isabel, please, the floor is yours. Yeah, just um, two things. Um, to add to Sergio's point on, on supermajority, I would say that um, we need to further analyze how supermajorities play with the voting system, the specific voting system. 
um, when we, and, and this was a discussion if we remember in the first assembly, but did the two thirds um, apply to the to the specific subcommittee only to the plenary session? Uh, because there's a lot of incentives that run um, within smaller groups than larger groups, and especially with the relationship between them, right? Um, and and you saw on both uh, on both conventions this idea of voting issue by issue, um, article by article, and then you saw all types of interpretations, right? Uh, on the on the last um, where you saw this idea, but they all agree. Look, they they are voting almost unanimously, uh, but then it was no, they're not uh, because that started from a draft, etc. But but this idea of of um, the the mixture between um, super majorities, the specific voting rules, and the blank slate. Right, you have one one um, one assembly that had a blank slate to start with. The other one had to start from the experts draft. Um, and so um, and of course the main thing is do the two thirds um, quorum um, sort of um, incentivize the collaboration or the veto power. And, and I think you can see both ways. Uh, the veto power was very clear in the in the last one. Um, on 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 the last question, um, I would say that there are some institutions that got I wouldn't say reinforced, but I think we're very challenged um, just before coming into the process into into the sorry into the first process, uh, and now. I would say that they are facing a very different environment, the Constitutional Court. The, the Constitutional Court at some point was sort of doomed to disappear. Um, they We just named the new ministers to the Constitutional Court last week. The discussion about was, it was, we have a very difficult process of appointments, but um, nobody in the, I, I would say maybe, I missed something, but there was no strong discussion on the Constitutional Court, um, as you could see four or five years before. Um, the Central Bank, the autonomy of the Central Bank was a debate on the first um, assembly, not anymore. So, so maybe um, there's, for some institutions, um, the failure of the two processes sort of, um, I wouldn't say this, held now a strong position, but but they are sort of in a different working environment. Um, there is a lot of, um, as said, you mentioned, um, reforms that will be crucial for the future, particularly the, the lower of the super majorities of the current constitution, how they will play out. There's another process that started before the reforms that what, this was a decentralization process, um, which is a very constitutional debate, um, and and that has sort of um, been debated, but for other reasons, um, uh, corruption reasons. But but it has moved forward again. So so you had this sort of dichotomy, right? A very big constitutional discussion and things happening in the meantime and moving ahead. Um, I would say that it, it was um, the main question, and this was something that came across a bit over the last few weeks. Um, I'm I'm not very sure that it will go through, but you saw some people saying, "Look, there was an agreement on a change in the political system. Maybe we can pick something of that up and take it to Congress and approve it." Um, I would say that the Congress today is too fragmented for that. Uh, but there was some conversation from political parties saying, look, we had an agreement on this a few months ago. Uh, so why don't we take that? And, and with that, we can change um, the idea. Time will tell how much the expert draft will be valued. You had a draft that was almost, it was unanimously approved from people from the far right to the Communist Party. So time will tell if that will sort of be put forth again, not now, but maybe um, in, a, in, in, a, in, I don't know, a couple of years. And I would say what is interesting to watch again is the, how this impacted general politics in general. So you saw um, political par parties surge and then fall in, the, in, in four years, right? And, and new representation and new leaders, and, and they disappeared completely 
um, from the political agenda. Uh, and you see that um, the more traditional parties have gained weight. Part of this is because we have local elections by the uh, in October this year. So there's a lot of that that we will see of how much of those constitutional leaders will continue to be part of the public debate um, and will sort of serve a more general politi political role. And I think that can be interesting for um, changing in leadership and in people um, that it participates in the debate as well. How much people got informed? I would say that after the last, uh, we have um, um, mandatory general, um, Sergio, ¿cómo se dice Franja Televisiva? TV campaigning. Yeah. Um, advertising like is like political advertising uh, for free on TV. All the channels are of like to provide it. And the parties and the independent movements, they divide it and then they advertise for free. The level of uh, politicization or, or, or polarization, sorry, but also of um, ridiculous interpretations of constitutional issues was total. So I would say that um, I, there was a lot of de for disinformation, but in general, you saw that people, at least um, we had a sort of a, it, this will be interesting to study, but a general um, civics education crash course. Uh, and for those who teach constitutional law, uh, the last four years have not been easy. Uh, so so I think uh, everybody's happy at least to know that there's a, one text that we should teach uh, in class. Uh, but but what time will tell how much this will play through for the coming years. Thank you so much, uh, Isabel. Uh, Tamara is apologizing. Her internet uh, just uh, broke. And just imagine the, the life she has teaching now public international law in Israel. It's even more uh, uh, challenging, I assume. Guys, we have to end. And this was indeed a fascinating event. I would like first to thank the audience and those who uh, came to watch. And this was really, I'm just looking at those who participated. And we have really a powerhouse group here of participants. Silvia, hello. This is an opportunity to congratulate Silvia Sutu for winning the Icon S Book Prize. This is an Icon S event. So a big mazel tov. Silvia, and it's also, I think, an opportunity to congratulate Sergio, who is the incoming president of ICANN uh, So I hope that the next event, we can host you already as the president of the of our society. Uh, I would like to thank Tamar for this collaboration uh, of ICANN and the Rubinstein Center for Control Challenges. Isabel, you as the dean, you're super busy and we really appreciate coming and to sit with us for an hour and a half during the day, really, I'm the vice dean and I can only imagine how uh, busy you are these days. So thank you very much, everyone. Uh, and I hope to see you on the next events and take care and good news, everyone. We will post this uh, event later on social media. So if you would want to forward it, uh, be our guest to do so. Thank you very much. Shalom, everyone.